Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this next session. Uh, this next session will be with uh, Florin Zurka, who will be talking about zero trust um, security. But um, what we want to do at this point is we want to thank our sponsor, Liquidware Labs, um, whose um, support would have made CUGCXL Canada possible. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, and uh, please um, tell us more about Liquidware Lab, what they have to offer, Jack Smith. Will do. Thank you. All right, so let's do quick screen share. Which one? That would be you. There we go. And let's get right into it. So uh, here at Liquidware, we uh, apparently we love Citrix. <laughs> I don't mean to sound that sarcastically. We actually do. A lot of our customers are Citrix-based customers. Um, we have three products that we do. We have a user environmental management, user profile type of thing, an application layering technology uh, called FlexApp, and a visibility deep dive analysis forensics tool called uh, Stratus for UX. Now, we help you all throughout the life cycles of what your environment might be, from planning from going from physical to Citrix, Citrix to uh, maybe WVD with Citrix or you know a different um, uh, set up of servers or new profiles or whatever it is that you're looking to do, onboarding your users from where they are to where they're going to be. So that could be between a new operating system or or to a different platform, cloud type thing. Um, and then, of course, helping you monitor and ultimately get a, a better production environment. So we work very closely uh, with a lot of our Citrix customers and Citrix SEs and field engineers and sales folks and all sorts of stuff. And we kind of bring together the virtual apps and desktop delivery methods and give you a more advanced way to get there. And we also do support all of the major clouds, maybe with the exception of Oracle. Um, but again, we, we might support it. I mean, Windows is Windows, honestly. So we don't really care how you get to your Windows. Um, we help enhance that. So Stratosphere is a big part of that, being able to look at multiple different disciplines and multiple different kinds of functional teams. So we're not just that help desk tool that gets to the desktop. We have storage visibility, server visibility, network, virtual vis visibility, security visibility, uh, kind of everything across the board. Uh, simple virtual appliance, put an agent out on the workstation, it collects up everything about everything and gives you a ton of information about what your environment is, uh, doing and what types of processes and things are running within it to help you identify root cause analysis. We also do support Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems. So not only do we handle the Citrix side of the house, but we can also handle that physical side of the house with that same license. So you can see both sides of the conversation. Profile Unity has a lot of different things going for it. One, it has a user, a dynamic user profile, which allows us to go anywhere. We have a profile disk format that allows you to do, you know, basically housing of the profiles or housing of Office 365 things or really housing of really anything. We have application management, which means elevation and application restrictions, as well as being able to do publish applications dynamically. And we have policy engines that allow you to do, you know, your typical drive mapping, pr printer mapping, reg key injections, all that sort of stuff. On top of F Profile Unity is FlexApp. FlexApp is included within the Profile Unity suite and allows you to dynamically attach applications to any given user, machine, or on demand. So we are very dynamic as to how you get the applications to your users in a very um, a unique, you know, uh, dynamic way. All of these items are contextually where filterable, but where, why, how, time of day, group policy, all that fun stuff, and we work across the platforms as well. So that means I can take an app that I did in Windows 10 and deliver it to my 2016, 2019 servers all the same without having to go through a repack procedure. Like I said, we do support profile disks as well. So we do have that option out there where you can utilize a profile disk or an attached virtual volume to house anything from the office suite to even large Chrome file systems and, and various different things like that. We also help you onboard uh, into the cloud. So we can harvest up your profile and allow you to move it to wherever you want to go. So if you want to go from you know your on-prem file share up to cloud-based storage, we can help you kind of get that data to where it needs to be uh, so that if you want to use object-based storage or a cloud filer, you can you can kind of just move it and, and continue on um, and put that uh, the compute in the cloud. Another thing is 
we have actually released a free, and I'll say it again really, really loud for the for the cheap seats, free VHD, VHDX compacting tool that's available up on our website. What that basically means is that I can take any of your profile disks, whether that be our profile disk type or a FSLogix profile disk type, um, and compact it down. So if you're finding that the disks are starting to get a little bloated and you want to shrink those things down to a reasonable size, uh, just go up onto our website. It's a free download. It's not paywall. Just you can download it, use it, compact the application or compact the disks down to more of a manageable um, size and go from there. And we have a lot of options in the thing, so check it out. And then lastly, we are bringing into uh, into the mix FlexApp automation that is coming this year. So we'll actually be able to take applications and uh, automatically package those applications across the board just using simple silent switches and, and you know, here's a CSV list, go, you know, and, and packaging multiple different applications uh, without even having to click a next, next, next finish button or anything in our UI interfaces. So that makes everything uh, faster and better and easier to get into uh, so that you can actually get to the things that you really should be doing is managing those workstations. Everything, uh, we're, we're trying to make everything easier, faster, and uh, more productive for you. All right, so that comes to my last slide and probably my five minutes. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So um, now I'd like to introduce Florin uh, Zerka, who's going to talk to us about uh, Zero Trust Model. Please take it away. Thank you, Derek. Hopefully everybody can see my screen and hear me just well. Uh, so um, I've had the pleasure of being with Citrix for uh, a number of years, uh, both on the customer facing side and internally. And uh, I want to spend the uh, next few minutes talking about uh, zero trust and you know, what does zero trust mean in a remote access world? Like, I'm sure we don't need to remind everybody that a lot of people are working remotely uh, for most of their most of their day, um, and then most of their their last year. Um, so I think it's you know doing security or achieving a zero trust model of security in a, in in this world is a little bit more difficult than it was in the past, just because of scale. Right? So um, typically, when we talk about zero trust, and I'm assuming, and I, I'm going to um, cover the zero trust in a little bit, um, assuming that. It's been around for about 15 years or so, the concept. Uh, so I want to spend some time on our approach of it. Um, there's a, some tenets of zero trust where you know, we look at you know, what is the fundamental to zero trust. is you know, secu it's securing the communication uh, regardless of what network it's coming from, whether that's encryption or some way of, of uh, making that, that communication be secure uh, from coming from a secure device, uh, authenticating it. Um, the resources that the users access are going to be considered, uh, whether it's data, it's a file, it's, it's just a resource. And access should be resource specific. So it shouldn't be a uh, carte blanche type of access to the network. And I've met with customers recently where you know, their their model for uh, remote access has been extending the VPN, extending the network through a VPN, through a full VPN, and kind of giving full access to uh, the network from home. And that really isn't what the zero trust approach is. Uh, you still want to lock it down per application, per resource, per data, per file, uh, per network, um, so that it's it's very tightened down. So you're, the concept of extending the moat to uh, uh, a home user or a remote user uh, should be really refined. Uh, but at the same time, you know what we want. What we're looking at is the ideal of having any application, whether it's sanctioned or unsanctioned. Uh, whether and by sanctioned or unsanctioned, I mean. Is it delivered by IT or is it something that's free roaming on the internet? Not a SaaS app, but maybe a, a, an internet-based application, a site that is used for work. Um, is it a device that's managed or unmanaged, right? So how do you differentiate between that and then any location? 
Now, that kind of brings up some issues with a lot of people's current technology debt is that you can't really achieve that uh, because you might have some legacy items in there, right, where you have fragmented user authentication. That could be by design. You may have multiple authentication points for failover or redundancy. Maybe you have failover by vendor or failover um, additional use cases such as admin access or uh, so you may go with multiple uh, solutions for access that are not tightly woven together. Uh, you have different administration, different uh, different uh, visibility and analysis into it. Um, and another uh, issue with you know just VPNs and in, in, in general is that they typically lack that access control that's granular, uh, where it's again not by application, not by port, not by protocol. But it might be, uh, and again, by design, it might need access to specific uh, protocols like voice that go over a VPN. Um, now, when you combine that with new threats that exist on on on, uh, on BYOD devices, right? So devices, let's say it's an unmanaged device that gets access to a network. Even if it's a managed device that gets access to a network, uh, maybe that device has excessive rights, excessive permissions for the user to install and to to, uh, to manipulate that system. Uh, and then actually, you know, connecting to uh, internet access uh, that is outside the scope of work, unsanctioned apps. Um, and then typically, you know, security architectures are not, are not optimized. You know, performance-wise, you may have a situation where you have uh, users connecting through a, a kind of a backhaul, connecting everything to the data center and then going out to the internet. And it reduces the user experience. Uh, and we all know anything that gets impacts the user experience tends to you know, lead to someone trying to find a way around it and not using it. Right? So case in point is you know, I worked for a company that had a two-factor authentication set up and it was a little bit clumsy at that point, and then they found some sort of backdoor, and everyone was using a backdoor of an engineering login that was uh, not protected with two-factor, right? So people always gravitate towards doing easy things on on, on security, maybe. Um, so if it's not optimized for performance or for ease of use, uh, it's very likely to, to find a uh, workaround. So when we look at uh, a zero-trust approach, Right, we want things like a single, sing, simple single sign-on, um, not only for ease of use, but that single sign-on to resources that, like for example, SaaS apps, will not only make the ease of use better, but it's a security feature as well, where you know that user may not have the their identity, their username and password of that SaaS app. So should they leave the organization, then they'll go ahead and lose that access when their normal their AD account, for example, are turned off. Uh, we want that continuous monitoring of that session from session in initiation to uh, to termination. Uh, and you want to be able to evaluate any risks that are occurring, right? So any risks that are occurring from the identity, is, should, is this a person that has a, a user risk score uh, that is potentially downloading um, too, many, too much data uh, from that device? Are they passing... Or is there a high risk score for the device not being patched or uh, not having the correct antivirus or firewall um, uh, software on there? Of course, location and time, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, is, is the connection coming from a, uh, a location or time that is doesn't fall within the normal activity of, of said user, right? So you know, connecting from one location and then 20 minutes later, connecting from a location that is geographically really remote, not able to travel that distance in that time, for example, right? So what access to the apps and data they uh, normally have, and then are they doing something that is outside that norm? And then are they connecting from a device that is not normally a device that they connect with, right? So th the goal here is not to say, all right, you've connected from a new device, you're going to go ahead and lose all access, but maybe it creates a flag where the administrators reach out to that uh, user and say, hey, did you get a new device? Or it feeds into another system that checks to see that there was a new device uh, associated with that user. 
All right. So having a a system that is end to end and continuous, and also has the visibility into user connection, that is closer to a, a zero trust model uh, than just simply, you know, sending out a device and telling here your credentials and, and log in and then hope for the best. So when uh, we're looking at trying to solve this, especially the issue of um, connecting to unsanctioned applications, right? So I think for sanctioned apps, you know, a lot of uh, vendors and including Citrix have done a lot of work for sanctioned apps, right? So these are enterprise um, approved and controlled and patched and updated app apps. But, you know, a lot of it is dealing with uh, applications that are, you know, websites that are on the internet, and uh, how do you how do you protect that? So, especially those that are at the edge, right? So apps at the edge. Uh, so Gartner Gardner came up with um, a list of capabilities that um, are core to uh, SASE solutions, or the uh, Secure Access Service Edge, and um, then some that are recommended. So some that are um, make it even more comprehensive. Right? So when we look at uh, Citrix's approach to it, we're the ones that do have checkboxes against all of these because we do have those capabilities in, in our uh, com combined products of uh, combined solution of uh, SIA or Citrix Secure Net Access and Citrix Secure Web Access. So I'll cover that in a few minutes. Um, when we're looking at you know, the comprehensive look at it, you know, so it's a it's a cloud de uh, delivered security stack, um, right? So that's really important because when you're talking about scale, when you're talking about rollout, when you're talking about uh, being able to uh, onboard, it doesn't require, it doesn't involve uh, you know, shipping and installing uh, appliances, um, and when you do have uh, unified management that makes the upkeep, the uh, the maintenance and the the keeping up to date of the services, uh, something that's on our on our uh, side of the table, right? So, um, when we're looking at the solution, we're looking at kind of this stack here. And so you have your users and your devices locations, and then the resources on the opposite side. Um, and remember back the zero trust approach about uh, identifying the user. Uh, keeping continuous look at the user uh, at, at their actions uh, with analytics and then extending that encryption and extending that uh, security from, from the user all the way to the resource per resource, right? So uh, I'll cover a little bit of, of the secure workspace access first, and then we'll cover uh, secure internet access as well. And then some of the uh, additional components such as SD-WAN I'll cover last. So this is where they complement each other. Uh, so with a secure workspace access, this is really tailored and designed for your sa sanction apps, right? So being able to do uh, add security features, security functionality to your published apps and desktops, as well as your internal web applications as well as to your SaaS based applications as well. And I'll show a video towards the end as, as part of a demo, uh, but I'll speak you to it now. You know, being able to do things like watermarking the screen keeps track of who's accessing the, uh, the, the application. Uh, someone should take a screenshot, should take a photo with their phone. It's a deterrent towards them doing that. Uh, being able to control, again, going back to the zero trust model being able to control access to these resources. So you're giving per app access, not per network access, per app access to these uh, virtualized apps, desktops and web apps uh, and SaaS apps. But then you're able to control even further, even more granularly by doing things like copying and paste restriction, being able to do uh, the ability to uh, block screen scraping being able to, so if someone was take a, a recording of, of, the, of the screen, uh, or if, if there was malware installed on your, say, BYOD device that does a recording of the screen and then 
uh, goes ahead and sends that recording screenshots uh, to a command and control server, it would block that uh, keyboard logging as well. So key logging uh, malware uh, that would you know, intercept your username, password, and any confidential data that's installed on a, uh, that's entered on a, say, a customer facing or customer uh, database. Um, that's all protected with the secure workspace access um, solution there. Now, let's say unsanctioned, and unsanctioned sounds a little bit uh, kind of wild west, but it's you know basically access to uh, internet-based uh, applications, right? So uh, it may be that it's within the scope of work. Uh, it may be that it's not within the scope of work. Uh, maybe it's personal websites and so forth, but how do you protect that endpoint from uh, not um, getting malware? How, how do you protect that endpoint from not allowing data loss? Uh, how do you protect that endpoint from um, a number of, of different protections that I'll cover in a little bit more depth later? Um, and so that's where they, they kind of overlap or they kind of meet is unsanctioned and sanctioned apps together. So with secure waste workspace access, right, you know, think of it this as you're connecting your user to the workspace app uh, or the workspace web browser or via the web browser. Uh, you put in your credentials, you're logged in, you get your applications, your desktops, your data, and so forth. So uh, there's a number of, of use cases that we have for this. Um, one of them is uh, that VPN-less access, right? So I mentioned VPNs earlier. You're connecting a full VPN from, um, from your endpoint, basically extending that network to uh, the user. Uh, that user may or may not, de depending on whether network, ac network access control is installed or configured, may have a lot of access to that network. And anything that's on that device can potentially you know, uh, have access into that internal network. So with VPN access, VPN less access to say web applications, right? So you have internal web applications that are being delivered, whether it's SharePoint or it's uh, OWA, uh, or whether it's just an in intranet application, um, getting access that is done with a, a clientless rewrite. And then we're also extending the same capabilities as I mentioned before, screenshot protection, malware protection, malware uh, recording, screen recording protection, being able to block against uh, and being able to add the watermark. And we also being able to uh, run that in a remote browser, right? So you're running that in a embedded remote browser that's running within um, the Workspace app. And so this remote browser is a Chromium-based browser that starts uh, when you click on, on the resource and you get that native experience. So you have the, op there's multiple options for delivering browser-based resource. Uh, in the past, when our customers still do this, and it's very popular, you have a virtualized browser on, on Zen app or, or whatever uh, that you're running it on. And then you have the ability to do um, a browser service that's running in, in Citrix Cloud. And then you have the ability to do the remote browser isolation with the uh, embedded browser and you can, you know, there's some resources that you can still run in a, in a, in a local browser as well. So being able to, and obviously you can run it in a VDI and run uh, the VDI browser as well. So the remote browser is just another um, on top of that. And what it really is nice is it does give you that native experience, right? So it gives you that native experience to those internal and SaaS apps. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's use cases where you want, you want that higher performance uh, running in natively. Let me just uh, shoot back real quickly. Uh, besides that, uh, the security protection, right, is is a single sign-on. Um, now, uh, that is, that's you know, not only a huge um, user experience improvement, but it's also a security uh, feature, as I mentioned before. I mentioned the security controls, and then they're protecting that corporate data and user information by using that uh, malware protection, that malware um, key keyboard logging and screen scraping protection. Now, 
when we go to uh, Citrix Secure Internet Access, uh, we're looking at a number of, of engines. Let me just say there are kind of engines that run within the service, so it's like Citrix Cloud Service, um, that does a, a lot of capabilities, right? So I'll go through a flowchart and a few slides that kind of breaks it down uh, to, so you see um, what exactly is being being done. But you know, there's a secure web gateway, so think of that as a, a forward proxy. Users connect through it to get access to the internet, and you can block and detect uh, based on categories, based on sites, and within even within uh, the the app itself, within the site itself, you can apply block functions as well. Uh, there's the firewall functionality that is uh, looks at both the, the incoming and outgoing traffic. Right, so uh, this is an agent that runs on the device uh, that will also run in uh, does also run in like in a virtualized environment as well. So let's say you are connecting from your remote, your home PC, uh, connecting to a virtualized desktop, uh, that virtualized desktop can have the agent installed. So any traffic that goes from that virtualized desktop is protected outbounds. But then you can also have that on, in your, on your remote PC as well. So should you not be within your, um, in your VDI environment, you can still have that protection. There's the ability of doing the uh, CASB or the Cloud Access Security Broker, right? So this is pretty cool. Like it actually goes, it's it's intelligent per application. It goes into the um, to the website itself and can enable and disable functionality within that within that app um, per configuration, right? So being able to block, um, like if you go to LinkedIn, it can block whether you can look for jobs, but you can still do the the chatting and so forth. Malware protection, huge, uh, huge number of sites out there that spread malware, right? So being able to identify and block uh, the malware and, and the sites that, that spread it. A DLP, uh, being able to look at the data that's, uh, for example, put in a, a post and identify it as uh, matching whether it looks like sensitive data, account numbers, uh, social security numbers, credit card numbers, and so forth. So being able to say, all right, maybe you were able to copy and paste that data or even enter it manually. When it gets sent to that site, it's going to be intercepted. So uh, it's actually sitting between the user and the uh, the site. And I'll keep that in mind because it'll make more sense when I talk about the, uh, the flow of the data. And uh, lastly, we're being able to just Safely, safely execute uh, suspicious code in, in a sandbox environment. So, when we uh, kind of break it down to look like what is the combined uh, flow, right? So, within your inside, within your workspace, inside your workspace, you have this your single sign on to all your apps that's internal and SaaS apps, right? So, this is pretty huge, right? You, you get this application, uh, this workspace, um, you're on your home machine, your local machine, um, and let's say that you have uh, some sort of virus on there, Trojan on there, and that is doing screen scraping. Right? So you launch workspace, it's not going to be able to grab anything within even the login portion of workspace. Uh, it's not going to be able to log, uh, grab screen captures. It actually just blank them out or key logging of whether you're, when you're in your applications. So now you're logged in your applications, um, you got single sign on, you're accessing your web apps, and now you need to go to a cloud uh, or internet site. So this is where the SIA or security internet access kicks in and does the outbound protection for internet and SaaS apps as well. Now. Should you be outside of your workspace, so you're not using workspace at all, then you have the additional, uh, you have the uh, the SIA or CSIA uh, functionality that you're using. And as I mentioned before, you can be within a virtualized app or a VDI, right? So that means the backend server or, or, or image would have the agent installed. 
And what's cool about this is that, right, let's say you're uh, in a shared environment, you have, say, 10, 20 users on a server or even on one VDI, it distinguishes um, between users because it actually uses AD credentials to map to um, policy groups that are defined within the, the uh, management portal to say this group, for example, uh, may not be allowed to get onto gambling sites. And so, and then you can potentially have another group that is, for example, right? So the, the question might be, you know, how, how, um, how is the traffic distinguished between multiple users on a, on a VDI session or on a shared session? And then uh, it's because of, of the user group extraction. All right, so within Citrus Cloud, so you have uh, secure internet access right on the on the right side there, and then secure workspace access as well. So they're within the unified within the unified cloud uh, management tool, um, and this ties in with all the other functionalities, right, with analytics and, and gateway functionalities uh, that we have in there. And just so it makes the ease of use uh, and the ease of integration. Uh, to get you know pull an, pull analytics out uh, much easier for us and uh, much easier for the customer. All right, so let's see if uh, we can dig in just a little deeper into um, this uh, security control. Uh, and you'll see here that we have web security in the middle column. Uh, there's the CASB functionality. So they're kind of broken down by the, uh, the the buckets of uh, I, I, of protection uh, that I mentioned earlier, and uh, for web security, you can go in and you can look at uh, blocking by category, right? So there's a list of, of categories that can be uh, blocked, uh, and again, this can be tied to a specific user group, and then you can also make exceptions. You can make exceptions for uh, the user group uh, to allow certain websites within a category, but block the category otherwise. For DLP, um, same thing, you can go in and turn on uh, which protections you wish to enable and then assign that to a user group. Uh, for the reporting and analytics, you can go in and actually go down and see uh, whether you're, you're hitting command and, consent, uh, command and control callbacks whether you're getting uh, protecting against infections and malware blocks as well. So the question might come up, like, and I mentioned it earlier in passing, but uh, there are a couple of ways to deploy this. Uh, one is with uh, an agent, right? so the Citrix SIA agent that's running, and it can run on, on multiple OSs. Uh, it runs on Windows and it runs on mobile devices and Macs and so forth. Um, you can install it um, on a virtual on a virtual desktop as well, on a backend server as well. And uh, there's also a way of doing it through VSD WAN. So you have remote users that, for example, may have a, um, a home SD WAN device the 110 version, for example. So it's a home office SD-WAN device uh, or a branch office SD-WAN device. Um, the 110 version, if you haven't seen it, is um, basically takes two, two, broad, two uh, ISPs, say broadband and LTE, and gives you that uh, failover and that performance increase uh, that should, should one of the services go down, your ISPs go down, um, and... Um, yeah, you know, very useful in a situation where people are, are working from home all the time. Now there are uh, okay, there are uh, different uh, ways of of deploying as well. So you can have a pack file uh, that has uh, kind of a file with all the the configuration in. You can also have the cloud connector, uh, as I mentioned. So this is the uh, the agent that runs on the device. Now, note, make a note here that it does install a certificate on the endpoint uh, that 
kind of delegates, or as you see here, man in the middle, which I think is a little bit scary <laughs> than saying delegate. It's basically you're decrypting the connection uh, to uh, basically look into that session, look into that session, right? So, and there are options to um, say, let's bypass certain websites or categories of, of websites then uh, and for privacy reasons, for example, that you wouldn't want. So uh, even though we, we may say man in the middle of decryption, I associate that with a man in the middle attack. So I prefer to use uh, delicate decryption myself personally. So you may hear both. Now, uh, let's kind of throw the, all the feature sets at you, right? So malware prediction, and website filtering, and DLP and the CASB uh, functionality as well. And so this all gets done in a single pass architecture. Uh, basically, uh, we'll go through the flow next. Uh, we look at every one of these requests and run them through a chain of, of processes and we make a decision on whether uh, it is allowed or blocked and uh, whether it uh, gets to the end where, it, where it's um, serve to the user, right? So um, just going through some of these, I'll pick one from each, right? So from malware protection, right? Being able to uh, do the IPS functionality, right? We'll see that on the next chart. Uh, website filtering, we talked about categories, but you can also block by MIME type, right? So you can block by um, specific you know, PDF files, for example. You want to block also file names and domain extensions. You can do that as well. Um, yeah, DLP, right? So looking into the stream and identifying the content and being able to uh, deny or allow based on whether that is uh, associated with uh, good content or not, or private content or not. And then the CASB functionality, being able to look into the to the app itself, to the site itself, and, and toggle on and off some of the functionality within the site. All right, so... Let's go and take a look at this. Now, I've made a couple updates since I've uploaded this, and I'll walk you through them. But um, you know, so this is the start right, right on the left side. Um, and the first, you know, first check is 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 the site on a on a bypass list. Right. So if it's on a bypass list where we choose not to enforce security, then it's bypassed directly. Right. So if it is not on a bypass list, whether we we check to see if it's blocked by the IPS. And if it is, then that request is dropped and we're blocked by the IPS, uh, no problem. And then we start looking at uh, whether, what happens now, right? So now we start looking at user association, right? So this is where we tag the username and what policy group are associated to that request. So um, base, now we start injecting that and we decide Pretty, pretty quickly, pretty early on, uh, should that request be decrypted. Um, if it is decrypted, um, you know, we look into it and we can do additional functionality. Um, if, we, if we don't decrypt it, um, we just pass it as it is encrypted. Now, we'll look at the proxy rule, whether it's blocked by that. We look at the CASB functionality, whether uh, it's blocked by that. Uh, we go into DLP, we go into uh, any third-party functionality that, that we will add in the future, uh, we look at um, whether it's on an allow list. Now, if it's on an allow list, but there isn't a higher block list, then pretty much your destination is allowed and you end up going to the end, which is the bottom right. Um, and then once you look at the allow, you can also look at the block list. Is it blocked by uh, web category, is it blocked by GIP, is it blocked by any additional web security, right? So this is kind of the flowchart of the execution of, of the logic there. All right, so when we look at um, the combined solution, we have the secure web workspace access where we're on sanctioned apps, secure internet access that is through unsanctioned apps, and then the SD-WAN extends that to be over multiple WANs, um, it has the ability to create tunnels directly into our uh, services. So now should, 
for whatever reason a service go down, it'll create a, uh, it'll use the backup link from the primary to the backup. And uh, if theoretically, if you're looking at, you know, optimally, if you're looking at what this would look like, you want to go from the hub and spoke to a model that has direct access to uh, these breakouts, but you might be vulnerable to some unpredictability. And that's where having that backup, that creation, automated creation of the tunnels uh, be done automatically. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go to just a quick video because I'm running short on time. And let's see if we can get that rolling. I'll speak to it as this happens. All right, so we have the user logging into Citrix Workspace. Um, this is you know, using two-factor authentication. Um, it could be any number of two-factor authentication. In this case, we're using Active Directory, Active Directory in a one-time uh, token. And so in this case, we are launching a uh, internal SharePoint site that's launching in that uh, embedded browser that I mentioned earlier. Um, as you can see here, we have the watermark added. We have basic functionality that uh, restricts, the, it restricts the basic function, functionality like printing, copy, paste. We actually block, you know, uh, traversal of, of URLs, so it goes directly to that site. Uh, once you went to go to downloads, we can restrict downloads as well. So there's a number of functionalities there are there that on top of that. So that was kind of the uh, secure workspace access that we didn't show the malware protection um, and the um, keyware keyboard protection, but that's that can be uh, seen elsewhere as well. Um, we have multiple links for that I can provide. Now for the internet access, so we have this browser, uh, the user um, logged in, and uh, we are going ahead and just going to launch a session. Right? So we're going to launch a Citrix Workspace session, and uh, we're going to go ahead and from within that desktop, go ahead and go to a, uh, a website. And I believe we're going to do a gambling website at this point. 777.com is a gambling website uh, that is blocked based on category and for this user as well. And then uh, you can also, as I mentioned, make exceptions. So you know, poker, for example, poker.com, for example, is a uh, another gambling website that we chose to uh, exclude from the protection at this point. Now you can also go in and go to YouTube, for example, and block uh, certain channels within YouTube. You can do channel redirect. So if you go to YouTube, you can actually automatically send somebody to uh, Citrix.com or whatever your your website is. You can also do things like uh, go ahead and um, redirect like a file sharing program to go to Citrix file sharing or whatever, OneDrive, whatever your, your primary is. Uh, so there's multiple ways of, of redirecting that traffic uh, to where you want it to go. So I think I'm a little bit over time, so I'm gonna switch it back. And I know that uh, Patrick is next. Thank you very much, Florin. I appreciate your uh, presentation. So up next team is uh, the is uh, Patrick Koval. Um, he'll be on the other uh, meeting. So uh, please switch over to your new meeting uh, right now. Thanks everyone for joining today. See you on the next one.